Okay, let's start. Um, we have so little time and so much to learn. So um, today we'll talk, so oh, yeah, um, I had initially planned to do like group statistics today, uh, but I've been sick apart from the lecture this week. So I have not been able to prepare that lecture so well. I had this one um, better prepared already. So I just moved this one up. Um, I think it's also better as a sort of, um, it fits better with the theme of this week. Um, so I think like in terms of content, it makes sense. Uh, but just so you know, we'll do the group stuff uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, the whole me having been sick also is the reason that there's not yet a quiz for this module. I'll make it today so that you'll be able to, you know, work on it at your leisure over the weekend and, and later on. So there will be a very strict deadline on that, just so you know. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, today we're gonna to talk about, uh, again, like a more modern way of approaching fMRI, of using uh, the fMRI signals. Um, and uh, what I'm showing you here on the screen is an example of what that type of analysis might lead to. So um, in the lecture, I'm showing you this, but I just wanted to highlight, it's also in the module, right? You can link to this. I really recommend that you go there if you haven't already. Um, it's the it's made by a piece of software called PyCortex, which you have noticed you are also using in the practical. So uh, one possible output of PyCortex is to produce these types of uh, renders of uh, of brains. Um, let me just go there for a bit. I just want to give a quick demo. I might return to it uh, at some point later during the lecture. Um, so if I can find my mouse pointer, there it is. Um, yeah. And so uh, this is a brain viewer that was created as an accompaniment to a paper published in 2016, which I'll talk about in a bit uh, later on in the second half of the lecture. Uh, but it just showed, just to show you, you can actually uh, just really look around the brain uh, very nicely, right? So this gives you a way of really inspecting and getting a feel for that 3D uh, nature of, uh, of the brain. Now, uh, what they're doing here what they're showing here uh, is the um, specific types of information processing that this specific location that I just clicked on in the brain, uh, the types of information that it likes when, listen, when someone listens to a story. Um, so what I, I'm, I'm using this now just as a preface to the lecture uh, to give you an idea of the type of things that we can also do. And it has to do with the fact that we are focusing on trying to explain the responses of a single voxel in terms of information processing. Okay. And so what we're looking at here, I'm clicking a voxel and what I get uh, is um, a model-based estimate of the, the concepts that this voxel likes. Uh, I really recommend that you go to the website, not during the lecture, of course, uh, and take the tour uh, that they have. They've made this beautiful sort of thing where you can click through the tour and it gives you an idea of how uh, what types of uh, information they're able to render on a brain like this. Uh, that just gives you an idea of, of where we're going in this lecture. Um, and it's just a beautiful uh, plaything. And this all has to do with the notion of using uh, the single voxel. Yeah. Um, so I'll just intro that uh, a bit, this notion, and try to contrast it with what we talked about on Wednesday. Uh, which is this sort of uh, the pattern analysis approach. So this is conceptually quite uh, different from that. Um, then I'll go through a bit of the history of this. What, where did the concept for this encoding models approach to fMRI, where did it come from? Uh, what's its tradition? And then uh, I'll show you what a bunch of examples that really highlight uh, the power of this approach that I think is uh, really the way to go uh, for fMRI um, in some ways, perhaps not in others. Um, so what we talked about earlier this week was this decoding approach, yeah, where we're starting to use the fMRI signals um, and these sophisticated machine learning type approaches 
to perform brain reading, right? And that was a really beautiful sort of novelty that I hope you got from this, right? Being able to read from someone's mind what their state of conscious awareness is regarding a stimulus, right? Or uh, regarding their dreams, for example. And in this case, what you're looking at is the pattern of activity across a certain region of Boston. So this is just a quick recap, just to highlight the, the larger concept. So we're looking at this uh, pattern across the region of interest, uh, and then we uh, train and test, right? So based on the pattern in that uh, part, we are able to say, uh, can I classify from the pattern in this region of interest uh, what was shown on the screen or uh, what someone was perceiving, uh, that sort of thing. So what we're doing here is we're uh, using as an outcome some sort of accuracy, right? Is this pattern classifier able to use the pattern in this region of interest uh, as a source of information? Can it learn this? Um, and uh, we use this classification accuracy to say a certain type of information is being represented or is being processed uh, in this region of interest. So what this means is a couple of important concepts here is that uh, we're always using a pattern of brain activation. Right? What this means is we need multiple voxels to draw this uh, distinction. We're always focused uh, on a pattern across a population of, of voxels in a given uh, region. And uh, we're letting the hard work be done uh, by the classifier. Right? And only if, if this classifier can find the pattern, uh, then we say we can successfully decode and so forth and so forth. So this is one of those principal caveats here is that if you are doing this type of MVPA analysis, um, you are leaving the hard work to that classification algorithm. And it means that you're somewhat blind to the origins of the patterns that this is picking up. Right? And this also means that when people started doing this, these origins were pretty open. So for example, when people started, uh, doing orientation decoding. So I show you a pattern, like an oriented pattern tilted to the left or to the right. I can decode this from your first visual region. People started to do this. And then there were really strong debates about how do those patterns that we, that apparently our classification algorithm is picking up, how do they relate to neural processing? Um, for example, one very, very large debate in this field was uh, whether you're picking up some sort of sub-voxel information by some sort of magic. The classification algorithm is, is actually uh, pulling apart like uh, uh, distributed information across uh, many voxels. And so what you're looking at is a tiny sort of uh, heterogeneity of sampling of orientation preferences within voxels. Um, or it could also be the case uh, that what it's picking up is a sort of global structure uh, across an entire region. Uh, there was a very strong debate, like tens, multiple tens of papers uh, were involved in this back and forth between someone saying, yeah, we're, we're really looking at like this heterogeneity of neural sampling within the voxels. It's a very detailed measure that we're looking at. Uh, and others showed then you can actually get maps of orientation processing in visual cortex, meaning that it's more likely that these classification algorithms are picking up like a global pattern. Uh, that's distributed across uh, an entire region of interest in this very sort of continuous way. So we're looking at maps instead of like a very salt and pepper thing uh, that this classification algorithm can very expertly pick up on. So this is just to point out, and I won't get into the specifics of this debate, but this is just to point out that the we're leaving a lot open, right? We are letting a lot of the heavy lifting be done uh, by this classification algorithm. And it means that in terms of inference, in terms of what we want to be able to say about what the neurons are doing, what the brain is doing underneath the measurement that we're taking uh, is left out in the open, right? We're not even trying to answer it. So what happens when you only care about a pattern is that 
in some sense, you are not interested enough anymore in what a single box is doing. And so what I'll be talking about today is to reevaluate, if you will, the importance of a single voxel and what, what it can tell us uh, about what the brain is doing. And so we're going to, in this approach, not say we need a whole region, we need a pattern over voxels, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus on that single voxel and see how we can use the signals that come from that single voxel as evidence for the types of information processing that happen in the brain. Okay. Now, you can imagine that if you understand what happens in a single voxel, you can also start to explain a pattern across multiple voxels, right? But if you use a single voxel as the explainance, I don't even know how to pronounce that word, uh, the thing to explain, right? Then that's the first thing that you try to do, and the pattern comes second. Instead of when you do multivoxel pattern analysis, the name already says it, it's the pattern that comes first. You're not that interested in the single voxel. Now, there's a distinct difference in approach here that I hope that you sort of feel. Tools. So, the idea then is we want to understand what happens inside that single voxel. And we want to be able to explain the computations that happen inside the single voxel by using a, a model. And our model is just going to describe uh, how information is processed by the population of neurons inside the model. So it's inherent that we use what we call an encoding model, that is an explicit model about how information is encoded in this voxel. I'm sorry, the, the transition seems to be a bit off. I should check that, my apologies. But the crucial sort of paradigmatic thing here is that what we're going to do is we're going to see that voxel differently, not just as that bucket of noise sort of sample that's somewhere in the brain and we don't know uh, what really it is sampling. What we're just going to do is say, well, I'm interested in neural processing, and I know that my voxel is sampling, let's say, a 50,000 neurons at the same time. And so if I can make a model of how these 50,000 neurons together encode information, then that's what I'm measuring uh, with, my, uh, with my voxel. My voxel is just some sort of nice average of what 50,000 neurons together uh, are uh, doing. Now then, here finally, if we have a full description of what every single voxel in the brain does in terms of information processing, you can see how it becomes more or less trivial to then perform decoding, okay? because you will know the meaning of a pattern of activation in a certain region of interest. You know what every single voxel is doing, and you see a pattern, you immediately know, ah, it's a face like this, or it's a house like that, or what have you. Yeah? So we, we can actually perform decoding based on uh, our encoding model uh, quantifications. Okay? So that's where this voxel-based approach, where we use encoding models to describe what single voxels are doing, is inherently different from this pattern analysis type approach. Is that clear? Yay. Cool. Um, and this is nice uh, for a few reasons. Let me just get into uh, that a bit. Uh, I don't need slides on this, but I think it's important to emphasize. So uh, we started out in fMRI, right? We had uh, four millimeter voxels on a side, 1.5 tesla. Uh, what you're reading out is a very sort of gross measure, uh, large, large, large draining veins that, that really pool into these voxels and you don't have that much in terms of uh, spatial specificity also. But what we are working with nowadays is we have voxels that are like one and a half millimeters in size, which is really, you know that you're sampling inside the gray matter uh, of the cerebral cortex, for example. You're just really in there. And at the same time, the higher field strengths that we're using now, they give us a lot higher SNR. And so what that means is we can actually start fitting our models uh, better. And so this is really, uh, this approach of valuing the single voxel really is 
something that the field has been working towards slowly by, by increasing uh, SNR, by, by uh, developing methods. This is really uh, starting to be able to use fMRI not as a tool for blobology, right? So because you have inherently a lot of uncertainty as to what is happening, uh, it is becoming more and more a neurophysiological measurement that you're taking. If your measurement is precise, more precise, and if your measurement is more um, clearly related to computational principles through your modeling uh, and through and to neuronal activations because you're just more uh, specific, uh, that means you your interpretation of what you're measuring starts to change and it becomes a more biological measurement, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, one major class of these encoding models that I talked about is that of uh, receptive fields. And I'll show you uh, what I mean by that concept. And those of you that have done uh, neural models uh, are going to feel like this is very familiar. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so receptive fields are a very important concept. Um, they receptive fields, we map them in, a, in the brain. And in the brain, we think that the, uh, a very strong sort of gradient of evolution of responses, and we talk about this a bit in the neuroscience lecture, uh, is going from things like the retina uh, through the entire visual system up to the hippocampus. Now, this is this uh, gradient from the sensory periphery uh, to uh, the default mode network, as we uh, talked about then. And we know that as we go from the sensory periphery into the brain, uh, there's a lot of things that happen to how the brain performs computations at each of these uh, levels. So uh, we start out with a very, very simple type of processing, very local uh, responses that only look at specific colors or specific orientations. And as we move up this, uh, this hierarchy of processing, and I could have made a similar type of schematic for uh, auditory processing or somatosensory processing is the same thing. Things become more abstract. So as we have, as we're piling on stages of computation, uh, we're increasing the abstraction of representations. We're also increasing the invariance. It doesn't matter so much where you're showing the dog anymore, as long as it's a dog shown anywhere. So it's invariant to the specific uh, location where you're showing things. There's also increased specialization. You would have a neuron uh, responding specifically to dogs versus cats, for example, and not to cats. <clears throat> things get more integrated across the senses as you move up. Uh, things get uh, more spread out in time. So not instantaneous, but trying to integrate over longer periods of time. Uh, and there's an increased interaction between what you're doing and, and what you're getting in. This could have been part of that uh, neuroscience uh, uh, lecture, but uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, take this, during this uh, lecture, I'm going to look at the single voxel uh, modeling approach. And then we're going to start out with these low level types of processing, where we have a very good handle on the type of model that we would need to explain processing that happens there, yeah. because uh, there are very strong analogies to, for example, animal research. But we're going to, during the lecture, move higher and higher up into this hierarchy and then thereby looking at types of processing, types of um, uh, activations that have to do uh, with things that are increasingly abstract, increasingly integrated, and increasingly complex. Yeah? Yeah. What, what, what is being shown in the diagram? What is like the overarching? Yeah, good point. Sorry. Um, so uh, this is a very famous uh, schematic of the interconnectivity of the visual cortex of the monkey, um, where the authors took together a whole bunch of literatures where people injected tracers in one region and then were able to see how that region connects with other regions and so forth and so forth. And <clears throat> what this is purporting to show uh, is that not only are there many different regions, they're all very strongly interconnected. 
Uh, and so what you have here is this sort of distributed hierarchy. Uh, there is a uh, bottom and a top, but there is also a lot of feedback happening. Uh, and so the, the general idea of this diagram is that you're really looking at like the network of uh, the visual cortex in this case. We could do a very similar thing uh, in terms of audition or, or what have you. Yeah. Sorry, I was a bit unclear there, yeah. Um, any other questions about like the general approach? Uh, and what we'll be talking about. Everything's clear. Cool. Okay. So, um, these encoding models. Um, we spoke a bit about this. Um, in this neural models course. Who do you follow the neural models course? Oh, not that many people. Okay. Uh, I guess that's good. Um, so many of these encoding models, they um, use as a stepping stone uh, the concept of the receptive field. Um, in many cases, people uh, have a just sort of interchangeably use the words encoding model and receptive field model. Um, for what we're going to be talking about. Now, this concept of the receptive field, it's uh, about a century old. Um, and what it means is that if you are measuring a neural response, be it a cell like a neuron, or be it a voxel, it doesn't really matter for the, uh, for the concept, you should be able to estimate or find a location or a, a location in a stimulus space that is a specific stimulus that maximally drives the response of the neuron that we're looking at or the voxel that we're looking at. Yeah? And so what we should be able to do then is say, ah, this stimulus um, will maximally drive this cell. Uh, and that is what we then can say is that this cell has a receptive field uh, that resembles this stimulus. Now, um, this was brought to a head in the 1950s when Hubel and Weasel performed their Nobel Prize winning experiment on the cat visual cortex. Um, and they found, and we didn't know this before, uh, those sort of basic characteristics that neurons in visual cortex and the lower levels of visual cortex, uh, the visual characteristics that they pick up on. So this was really foundational because we first, this, this gave us the first impression visually of what a receptive field would look like uh, in visual cortex. So what I'm going to do is show you a movie of uh, the experiment that they did. I think it's not the actual experiment, but they like repeated it for the movie. Um, and so uh, we'll be playing that here. So we're going to first sample a specific symptom. Supporting your cell with your hearing here.
See how powerful it is, right? If I can measure the response to you think i mean yeah <laughs> Which graph? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is at the bottom of that uh, pyramid. Yeah. Uh, so you, this is you. Yeah, you need to be in visual area V one to find this orientation selectivity. Um, but this is a single cell. Yeah. So the work that they did was uh, a bit tedious, uh, but they would have to like draw their own electrodes, like a lot of handiwork, and then. Uh, you, they would have to like put it in the brain of a cat in a specific location and then, you know, put it on the speaker and see whether, and then just show random stuff. And then at some point you start hearing this clicky thing and then you know that you're near a cell. Uh, and, uh, sometimes you go accidentally through the cell and you hear like, <laughs> and, and then, you know, you have to go hunting for the next one. Um, that sort of thing. So it's a very sort of, um, like you say, invasive, but yeah, like a, you can't even imagine, like they didn't have computers, right? This was the fifties. So they would, this is like a slideshow sort of thing, uh, like a, these old sort of light barred things. Uh, their measurements would be on these analog oscilloscopes uh, and the measurements would all be on paper rolls and, and that sort of thing. It's all very low down sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, so so this is a excellent point. So the whole idea of the lecture here is that this gives us like a tradition, right, uh, and a concept that we can try to start to use. That if fMRI is a neurophysiological measurement, like I just said in the, when I was just monologuing for nothing, um, we're more and more uh, you know getting fMRI to the point where we can say we're just sampling a thousand of these, we're sampling ten thousand. And then you say, okay, but if I have 10,000 of these that are distributed inside the tissue in some way, I'm just taking a local subset of, let's say, 10,000, that should give me a response, like some way to the average of 10,000 of these. And that actually is a computational and explicit uh, model uh, of what the neuron should be doing. Um, and of course, yeah, well, so the... Uh, the technology also in the animal uh, electrophysiology has gone a lot further, right? So now we have like chronic, chronically implanted electrodes, thousands of them at the same time. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah. But we're doing uh, brain imaging here. So uh, yeah, our, our hope is, and so this is really the tenet of the lecture, right? Um, and also the tenet of one of the more modern ways of using fMRI is that we can take this tradition and this way of thinking, like we try to relate something that's happening in the outside world or, you know, in some cases in the inside world, in terms of cognition, to the responses of single uh, voxels. By analogy uh, with these uh, single neurons and populations of neurons. So, um, what I'm going to do is, is use that structure of the, uh, of the brain that I showed you, like going from the lower levels towards the higher levels, uh, and use that as a scaffolding uh, to show you how processing changes that we know in electrophysiology, and then show how we are doing similar things in uh, fMRI.
So in the thalamus, uh, which is this relay station, so uh, information comes from the retina, it enters the thalamus and then continues towards the visual cortex. So the thalamus is earlier than the visual cortex that we just saw. Uh, there's no orientation sensitivity still. So if you look at the window onto the world that cells in the thalamus have, it doesn't have orientation, they're still round. As you see here, this is the spatial extent and here uh, you see the activation. This is really like the pattern in the visual surroundings that this cell is picking up. And then as you move to V1, we start to see these cells that are uh, oriented, that have a specific orientation that they like. There's beautiful models on how you can go from this to this by some way of pooling. You can also uh, start to take time into account. Since so on this, this cell, it likes a specific frequency of flickering uh, because here we have time. It likes things to reverse from bright to dark and from dark to bright, I think, um, uh, within something like uh, 150 milliseconds or so. So this thing responds maximally uh, whenever, whenever something like it uh, oscillates at seven hertz on a screen. Uh, and uh, in again, in V1, uh, you get these receptive fields that in time and space are tilted, which means they don't just like, they don't like a specific orientation, uh, but what they like is a specific direction of movement and a sp specific speed of movement in many cases also. Yeah. And so they, here you see an example of how hmm, the type of processing that happens in neurons as you are in this hierarchy, uh, it changes from the simplest possible things to more and more complex things already even at the lowest levels, start to add specificities. And these, these receptive fields become larger uh, and they start to detect more specific stuff that happens inside that window. Clear? Cool. And so the first thing uh, that's important to, uh, to think about here, because I'm just gonna build this up slowly in terms of fMRI, um, is that these all have a specific location uh, in the visual field. So that's, they're all sort of stuck to the eye, to the retina. Uh, so for example, this one, you see it goes from zero, zero to three, three. Uh, so this is, if this is where you're looking, uh, this is the region right top, right, right above it, uh, on the right and above it. Right? That's where, what it likes uh, as a location for stimuli. That's what it responds to. So these all have a very specific uh, location uh, in uh, the visual field because they're tied to a specific location on the retina. Now, we can do this sort of um, analysis and this is sort of experiment also in, um, in fMRI. Uh, and um, what we find, and this is also something that people and people already also have, is that two neighboring cells, they actually have uh, receptive fields that are very close together. They're, and if you create a track going through the brain, you go neighboring cell to neighboring cell to neighboring cell, uh, you see that the receptive fields also shift in a very uh, definite pattern. And so if we do an fMRI experiment, we can actually map these locations that are voxels like, and then uh, find the retinotopic maps of the visual brain, right? So, um, a specific location in V1. So this is V1, that first visual region here between the red, blue, green. So green and red are the boundaries. <clears throat> this has a, a half map of visual space. And what we can do with the fMRI is we can, we can find that map. Uh, and for example, for every voxel, we can color it according to the location in the visual field that it likes uh, and thereby visualize these maps on the surface. So by performing a very specific analysis at the level of the voxels, uh, we can relate the activation in those voxels to a specific uh, uh, thing in the outside world, a specific location in the outside world in this case. In this case, we're not interested too much in things like uh, orientation. We'll get to that. Uh, but this is all in terms of uh, visual field location. Now, how do we do that? We're going to do uh, in fMRI, an experiment that's extremely similar to the experiment that I showed you uh, in the Hubel and Weasel ex uh, example. We're going to do uh, an experiment where people fixate the center of a screen. So this is the, uh, the screen that people are looking at in the scanner. Uh, and this is a, 
flat map that if you've seen the first practical, you know more or less how to orient yourself, right? So this is the uh, visual cortex, uh, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. The frontal cortex is there. Uh, this is like parietal lobe. Yeah. What I'm going to show you is a movie of both. So I'm going to show you a sped up movie of what's happening on the screen, and then you're going to see uh, brain activations happening uh, on the right. Yeah, so just raw, more or less raw time forces. So you see that we're using a very strong visual stimulus, similar to that bar that the Hubel and Weasel experiment featured, right? Uh, I only have two of these, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, so you see the bar passing by, and then you see this wave of activation happening uh, on the surface of the brain, right? And this, this again, is a uh, evidence for these maps, right? If I, if I have a map representation in my head, uh, I show something that's passing on the, on the retina, uh, that it should also be passing in a similar way uh, on the surface of the cortex. So all of the things where you see a wave happening here, all of those regions, uh, they actually have maps of visual space. Just to give you an idea of what an experiment looks like, this is without it being sped up because we aren't looking at single unit responses in a in a monkey or a cat. We're looking at voxel responses in a um, in a human brain, of course. And people are supposed to fixate and then perform a task on that bar. This is like, is it more red green or is it more blue yellow? Just try it for a bit. Uh, <clears throat> you see, it's slow. Yeah. It takes about 30 seconds for this bar to pass through, whereas the Hubel and Weasel thing, they can just do this, right? So we're still stuck with that sluggishness of the bold response that we need to work around or work around, work with, if you will. Um, and you see how, um, yeah, how we were sort of stuck with doing very, very simple experiments. We want to map out uh, these uh, written public maps. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm focusing on these low levels of the visual cortex that have very simple types of processing. Uh, and what I'm now going to do is move to the models that we use to explain single voxel responses there, right? So what I'm gonna do is take the data from this experiment and look at a single voxel and see whether I can model uh, the time course uh, of that model. Uh, I'm not going to quiz you on the exact uh, uh, equation here, uh, but the point is I can make an explicit model of what's happening uh, in the brain. Get a time course of responses. So you see that in this bar experiment, there were eight of these bar passes. It's a very typical, what we call a retinotopic mapping experiment. You see these bars passing. They do it eight times in a single experimental run in six minutes or so. And what do you see here? Eight bolts of activation. Yeah. So we know already that we're looking at a visually responsive voxel. That is to say, the neurons inside this voxel, they all have uh, some location preference uh, inside this stimulus region. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing these eight bumps of activation. Right? And now, what do we get when we use a model like this? So this is a very sim simple uh, two-dimensional Gaussian uh, model. Um, the model in space looks like this. It's very similar to those receptive fields that I showed you in, in LGN and, uh, and V1, right? It's just the location in visual space. And we have parameters, namely this X0 and XY. They can shift this model, this model's receptive field around. We also have a size parameter. Uh, that allows us to change the size of that uh, receptive field. Okay. And so what we can start to do now uh, is estimate these parameters uh, given our data, estimate these parameters based on uh, the data that we're recording from the single voxel. And so when we do this, uh, we can iterate this. I won't go into the specifics of the procedure. That's not really important here. Uh, but what we get is this uh, description of what is happening inside this voxel. Uh, it's saying the receptor fields of the neurons, of this population of neurons uh, inside this voxel, uh, the receptor fields are all in this specific location in the visual field. And thereby, we have a model 
where with which we can actually explain the time course of activation uh, for the voxel that we're interested in. Just to highlight, this is happening at the single voxel level. And so we are performing a full uh, model-based analysis at the single voxel level. And we are explicitly also referring back to this tradition of electrophysiology, where we're saying uh, we're not seeing this voxel as you know, an FMRI thing that we need to do uh, a statistics on necessarily. No, we're seeing this as representing a population of neurons that we're trying to understand the responses of. Hmm. So, um, yeah, if you want, uh, if you're uh, intrigued by this stimulus, um, we have like five experiments running uh, where people look at these. So if you really like those, you can definitely volunteer to be uh, a participant. Yeah. So um, if you're looking at exercise, so much bigger than more than just one neuron. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we also have the delayed response in the time for the interval. Why is FMI still the right case? Why is still why is FMI still the right method to do this? Yeah, I get what you mean. You you yeah, and, and it'd be very reasonable to say, like, ah, but wait, mm, FMRI is so slow, right? Uh, neurons are so fast, you're just, you know, there's an enormous caveat here. And I would agree with you. Uh, there is an enormous caveat there. Um, what you're what you're doing is you're using this assumption of simple responses right and um saying something like yeah i think the the voxel is just you know doing a like a linear pooling of whatever is happening inside it in terms of neurons and then you try to tailor your experiment such that this um the speed of the responses in v1 right they could do a lot of things right this experiment is so simple uh you're not really asking the v1 neuron to do a lot of temporally complex things, right? And so by your experiment, you're actually trying to align what the neurons are doing and what you can pick up using uh, the bold signal. And that's the, yeah, that's why we think we can get away with this. Yeah, but it's true that we're, we're like in all of these things, right? There are caveats. This is one major caveat and we are sort of sweeping things under the rug. An inherent thing that we always do in fMRI and in any science is that you just assume a specific thing, a very simple thing that's reasonable uh, as a first approximation, and then try to work with it, right? It's a physicist saying, let's assume a spherical cow if we want to do calculations on milk production, right? It's doing a very simple first step, see how far it takes us, and then refining it. Well, it's also, I also think the possibilities, other possibilities are limited well yeah exactly yeah yeah so i would love to you know put electrodes in all of your brains it's just that no one is allowing me to um yeah um there's the ethical like you could do for example meg right and then you get the so we're all we're all stuck in this world where you have limited possibilities you could start to do meg um we would have our millisecond time precision right um, but we would lose the spatial precision. And so, um, yeah, where we are is that at the moment, fMRI is giving us such a combination of temporal and spatial specificity uh, that at least this idea of sampling from a local neural population uh, makes sense if you make sure that your model and your experiment are both simple enough. Yeah. Um, quickly, though, um, you can make these models more and more complex. So what I just showed you was the simplest possible model. Uh, and then, of course, when this runs, you can start making it more and more complex. Um, for example, we know that the uh, brain doesn't respond completely linearly uh, in terms of uh, when you show a visual stimulus. Uh, so you can get like you can add like things like a compressive nonlinearity that you see there uh, and then better um, explain the responses of these single boxes. You can go more and more complex. The point here, though, is that we are still using the measurement of a single voxel. I won't quiz you on specifics here, so don't get, don't get scared. Um, the point here is we're still looking at the responses of single neurons, and now we have created an arena in which uh, different models get to compete to explain what's happening in our voxel. Okay? And so we can start to compare models uh, against one another 
uh, and so forth and so forth. And we can really start to, we're in the business of uh, understanding the types of computations that the brain is implementing at the local neural population level with the caveats that we spoke about, right? The temporal uh, complexity has to be low and so forth and so forth. Yeah. So you sort of see the, the, the promise of the paradigm here, I hope. And with that, I think we should have a break. Uh, I'll see you back here at 55 on that clock. Don't take the clock with you, but you know. Um... <clears throat> Oh no, I will, oh, I will, sorry, I will upload the video. Tell me. I uh, read your paper on device normalization. Oh, excellent. And I was wondering about these normalization constants. Mm -hmm. So I think if I understood correctly, one is for activation and one is for inhibition. Well, no. So inhibition <clears throat> implies uh, a uh, suppression, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it doesn't need to be a suppression. It can be like this divisive uh, architecture. It can do things uh, like yeah. this compression thing, right? Yeah. So that's the, the main uh, idea is that if you have this um, this ratio yeah, like, here, like so, mm -hmm. you can get both the suppression and the compression. Yeah. Um, yeah, without having to choose because the, the specific settings of mm -hmm. the parameters mm -hmm. will tune the model to perform either one or the other. Does that? The, so one is compression. Mm -hmm. The other one is suppression. Suppression. Yeah. So if you okay. if you look at the time courses, I think there is, is a, so this, for example, is a very nice signature of suppression, right? You see that the, the responses go down, they go sub baseline. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this means that uh, you know you have a baseline and, and you get a suppression of the response. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we see that these larger receptive fields here, uh, they're actually very compressed. So if you compare the blue curve. Uh, to the uh, red curve, for example, you can see that the blue curve has to go up quickly because it's a linear model, whereas the red and the orange curve, they can go uh, very, they can be compressed like so, right? So they can go up yeah. really fast yeah. and then stay up really long. Okay. Um, and so that's the type of thing that you see happening here. So you're this the orange relative to the blue one, yeah. it's compressed against the ceiling sort of thing. Yeah. That's what you're seeing in yeah. the response. If you were to multiply all of the blue ones and then <laughs> and then press them down, mm -hmm. it would compress them down. That's exactly what that nonlinearity is doing. Yep. Okay. Uh, then you would get the blue response. And you need that sort of processing to, to capture these responses because you see that the data is actually showing that that signature. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then how how does that relate to the um, to this ratio that you subtract? Oh yeah, you just subtract the ratio at the end to provide zero as a uh, as a prediction when there is no stimulus. So if you if you don't have an input, right, yeah. it means that what goes into this is zero, this mm. is also zero, and what you're predicting is okay. b over d. Okay, but when there's no stimulus, you predict zero response. So you need to then subtract b over yeah. d to make sure that you. But it's a sort of yeah. You just okay. need to add it there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just to get zero at zero. Yeah. 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 And uh, this is also something you were working on right now, like the population subject field. Kind of yeah. Way. Yeah. So we are actively developing this model. Mm -hmm. um, so the PhD, Marco, the PhD student mm -hmm. that did this, uh, is interested in um, yeah, what these parameters relate to mm -hmm. in the brain. And so he's done things like looking at receptor densities using PET and correlating them with mm -hmm. these patterns um, across the brain. And he's now, he's now running a psilocybin experiments, right? So we're trying to modulate the specifically the D parameter uh, uh, experimentally, right? So to really perform like a causal manipulation. <laughs> we're also using the same sort of architecture to um, uh, do things like, um, uh, so you can also see you could, for example, if you have a response in V3, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can say that uh, this is the result not of a stimulus uh, being sampled in visual space, 
uh, but a pattern of bold response is sampled on the surface of V1, right? So V1 is this yeah. uh, map of visual space. Uh, and so what you can do is uh, create like a similar model, but then not making it a population receptive field model. So not receptive to something that's in the outside world, but you're making it a connective field model. So it connects to some patch in V1. And so that will also, then you have, so you have a central patch and a surround patch. Yeah. They interact also in the same way. Yeah. Uh, and that's, so my PhD student, Ron is working on that. Um, and so he's showing that that actually helps to explain V3 responses by implementing this nonlinearity. So it seems to be a sort of mm -hmm. standard way in which we, um, uh, yeah, can do this sort of thing. That's a bit vague. Um, but yeah, it seems to be a um, uh, really strong um, yeah, approach, really. It seems to be applicable to many different types of things. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. So the idea is uh, that fitting these, these types of models these but also these yeah. um <clears throat> we're now doing with a uh with a package uh but there are no like it works mm -hmm. uh, and many people are using it uh but it needs a step up in terms of uh you know documentation and that sort of thing okay. uh and so that's one of the things that i'm thinking of uh, we might do mm -hmm. you created the, the package yeah cool um and then i guess my last question was like um i think you touched a bit on it in this lecture but um you have this mexican head profile right in the in the nucleus mm -hmm. yeah the lgn thing yeah 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 um and how like what is our assumption to get the same kind of tropa at least for the gaussian mm -hmm. model in a population of the field. Oh yeah, so, so that's the um, overlay a lot of like if an individual neuron has that you just overlay it and then it will also have the center surround over it. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. So you need a separate. Um, so this is what actually creates yeah. that Mexican hat, right? And here the Mexican hat is explicit in that uh, you have a center and you subtract the surround, and so it's always going to have this suppressive flank yeah. at the sides because it's subtraction. Yeah. Um, and so this is how you generally model this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. This is a Mexican hat that you're making, yeah. Yeah. Um, just explicitly. Um, and so this can do that sort of thing, uh, but only with a specific set of parameters in this mm -hmm. case. Um, uh, and so anything that this can do, this can do also. Yeah. Anything that this can do, this can do also, but these two never apply to one another. Right? So this one tries to capture compression. This one tries mm -hmm. to capture suppression neither can do the other and, and that's why we're interested in this model because it can do both and here also the the parameters we fit on a box of yes right. yes so. exactly yeah and that's really the beauty of it. yeah um that we really get these local population estimates uh, where we think that the um the the voxel response yeah. is actually reflecting the neural response underpinning it yeah so Basically, if you want to get from a from a neuron by neuron model to the to the voxel model, like from the receptive field to a population receptive field, um, you should theoretically be able to just overlay the the neural responses. Yeah, and then it should create the same. Yeah, shape. yeah, yeah. You just say I have uh, in this voxel. I'm assuming that I have ten thousand neurons. Mm -hmm. I think that their receptive fields are spread out inside this voxel, yeah. like such and like such and such. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I can take this sort of average of all of these one ten thousand uh, uh, neuronal receptive fields, and that should produce my population receptive field. Uh, and that's the way it should work. Yeah. And this, uh, it's a bit um, difficult to keep doing this, taking a neural model and making a voxel model, and then yeah. But um, we do it it's possible right it's, it's still you're still in the same tradition you're still in this conceptual framework where uh your prf model should reflect this yeah i, I guess you just need to validate it right like you exactly. just need to show that okay we can model this with the uh, with some neurons and then once the once the approach is out there you don't really have to do it all over yeah yeah and you can you still have to be mindful that you know it's a caveat there is a translation step but it is very straightforward in most yeah. cases so uh yeah that's um so it's important to yeah to keep yeah. Um, keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what we do. I'm gonna answer a question and quickly get a coffee yep. and then uh, to start up again. Excellent.
So a lot, of, a lot of researchers have a beef with that. Yeah. <clears throat> Yay. Yeah. Okay, so I hope um, this first part of the lecture has given you an idea of the sort of uh, inferential power of this approach in principle, yeah? 
you've seen where the idea comes from. You've seen how explicitly this approach to fMRI tries to inherit from this electrophysiological tradition where there are explicit predictions and explicit uh, models of what the brain is doing. What, what are the computations that neurons are performing? Um, <clears throat> now, what we've done up until now is just looked at um, simple models of single voxels. We're going to move to more complex models. Uh, I also want to highlight one thing that we can do once we have a description of a population of voxels. So for every voxel, we uh, can estimate its population receptive field is what we call it. So that is the receptive field of the population of neurons inside the voxel. We can do this in a full region <clears throat> and then actually use these estimates uh, to perform decoding. The crucial thing here is though that uh, we're not doing decoding uh, based on like a classification algorithm that's, that, we, that we can say this is correct or incorrect, uh, but we can actually try to reconstruct stimuli from patterns of brain activation. So one method that we are uh, working on in the lab <clears throat> is called, it's like a Bayesian uh, decoder uh, based on uh, this uh, encoding model uh, fitting. <laughs> where uh, what we're interested in uh, is a probability distribution over stimuli given a bold response. So B is what we measure and S is what we're interested in, what we put on the screen. Again, I won't go through equations in the, in the thing. Uh, what's it called? A, an exam, right? Yeah. Um, so here the stimulus is S and B is the bold response. Um, we don't care so much about the prior <clears throat> of these two components. Um, what we care about uh, is uh, this equality here, this sort of approximate equality there. Uh, we, if we understand the relation uh, between uh, bold responses and stimuli, uh, then we can sort of invert this model uh, and say, now we understand, uh, now we can take a pattern of bold responses. So P of S given B, that's the B is measured. We can take a pattern of B, uh, and then try to reconstruct the stimulus. That's the idea, right? So our encoding model fitting performs this. We get a bunch of bold signals and we fit how that relates to the stimulus. And then we can invert this uh, approach. <clears throat> so um, what you do is you have someone uh, in the scanner, right? And they look at this sort of pattern with uh, these bars. Uh, it's identical to what I just showed you. Um, and you get these bold responses and you fit these receptive field models. Uh, and what you have is an overlap between the receptive fields. I'm just speaking about this very quantitative, qualitatively. Uh, if you have questions about how this sort of thing works, we can talk about it in detail uh, later. Mm -hmm. But we also take into account the, uh, uh, the covariance matrix of the noise to be able to uh, perform this uh, decoding. And then we can uh, calculate over time uh, the probability distribution over stimuli given some bold, or bold response. So what you put in uh, is all of these calculations and some test set uh, bold pattern. And the result is that you recreate uh, stimuli from a pattern of bold responses. So without going into details regarding the methods, you see how this type of approach allows us to be much richer in terms of our decoding, right? So not only uh, have we uh, understood what, every, what makes every voxel tick, uh, the pattern of our voxels as a whole uh, actually allows us to reconstruct the uh, visual stimuli from a pattern of brain activation, right? You see also how this type of representation is much richer than single pattern analysis classification algorithm uh, would give us like a yes or no judgment, right? Or some maybe multi-class classification type thing. But this is uh, really a full probabilistic decoding uh, of uh, what evidence the bold pattern gives you uh, of things in a stimulus space. Okay? Uh, if that's not nice, I don't know what it is. No, um, um, this is <clears throat> what I think is a very valuable uh, contribution here, right? We're moving beyond just uh, taking a pattern, letting some classification algorithm uh, understand it for us. No, we're doing the heavy lifting ourselves, right? We're really working to understand what every voxel is doing. 
And then we can really start to understand what a pattern of bold responses is evidence for in terms of stimuli that are happening in the outside world. So I hope that uh, difference is uh, clear. <clears throat> now, as I promised, I'm going to go from simple models to more and more complex models, right? And I'm not going to make this more complex in terms of maths or something. Uh, I'm just going to take that hierarchy that we were uh, talking about before, right? We start with simple types of uh, analysis that these lower levels of the visual system are doing. We're starting out with the visual, visual system. <clears throat> and we're moving up uh, and making um, processing more and more abstract. Right? So these models that we've talked about up until now, they didn't have orientation. And we can start to add orientation to our receptive field models. So this is a beautiful study from uh, 2008 uh, already, where uh, they showed natural images to people. And of course, these natural images, they have local orientations, right? And so then what you can do is fit this computational model that actually has orient orientation and things like spatial frequency and like more complicated visual characteristics um, in it. Um, and then uh, use what we call penalized regression to estimate the parameters of uh, this model. So uh, one quick segue into um, this, um, how you do this sort of thing. So up until now, we've talked only about uh, using a general linear model to um, fit bold responses. And we've talked about how we could combine, I think in the practical, we had three relevant regressors, right? Bodies, faces, and I forget. But only a few, right? In this case, uh, what we have is regressors for each and every one of these little steps. And they turn out to have like 1,200 of these uh, in the model. And so instead of having three regressors, now we have 1,200 regressors. And this turns out to be pretty problematic. So just a quick segue into uh, what we need to do to be able to fit models like this. And then I'm going to continue uh, on our, our way. Uh, again, I'm not going to quiz you on the maths of this. I think that's uh, over the top, but you do need to understand the, the concepts behind this. Yeah. So uh, in a standard uh, GLM solution, uh, when you do this, uh, you sort of assume that uh, this design matrix is full rank. And what that means is that uh, it doesn't have all sorts of parallel uh, regressors in it. But as you start to add numbers of regressors, uh, and especially if the, as they start uh, going beyond the number of time points in your analysis, uh, then uh, this solution, like when your computer does this, tries to implement this, it becomes numerically unstable and the whole thing explodes. Um, and so uh, this, if you are just doing standard GLM analysis, is enough, right? I gave you these rules of thumbs, like if you have 20 time points for each regressor in your analysis, that sort of thing, uh, then this still works. But in if we are trying to estimate complicated uh, receptive field models, then this stops being sufficient. Uh, and, and we do things that are um, generally based on ridge regression. Who of you are familiar with ridge regression? Okay, good, good, okay. <clears throat> and so uh, what we want to do um, is penalize the regression. Now, what does this mean? All very conceptually, right? Um, we're forcing all of the beta weights that we got, get out uh, towards zero because if we have, we're still using this, our beta weights can become 10 to the 20th or something uh, because of this numerical instability. So what we're going to do is force them all uh, to zero in a uh, in a sort of continuous way uh, in terms of when we're doing this L2 uh, regression. And you see how the two relate to one another, right? These are here. These equations are just here to show you the parallels between the two. They are very, very similar. Right? We're just adding this single thing here, this lambda identity matrix, right? Uh, and uh, what this means is uh, if lambda is zero, of course, then that whole thing is zero and we're not adding anything and we revert back to this, right? So uh, this is a superset of this. That's the only reason why the equations are there. So if this is zero, we just have this. And this also means that if, if we increase uh, lambda, 
uh, what we're going to do is uh, penalize this problem uh, more and more strongly. What this does is it forces all of the betas towards zero uh, and thereby gives us the ability to find like a global solution to this problem that OLS would not be able to give us because uh, this matrix inversion doesn't work anymore. And by adding uh, a lot of identity matrix to it, uh, it becomes uh, more easily invertible. Now, if many of many of the things that I just said were a bit abracadabra for you, don't worry about it. Um, uh, the point is, uh, we have a tool to fit very complicated um, uh, regression models if we want. Uh, what one crucial component of that uh, is this single parameter uh, that we then uh, need to cross validate. Right. So this type of analysis becomes more similar to like a machine learning uh, type approach. Um, and we use it uh, a lot in the lab. There are uh, more sophisticated ways of doing this, and it's a, a very nice uh, type of thing to be able to just switch to if your models get more uh, complicated. Right, so uh, just to continue this brief segue for one minute more, if we're fitting these encoding models, these receptive field models, there are two specific ways that we uh, might use. There's two different ways but they end up doing the same thing. They allow us to capture what is happening in the single voxel uh, using a computational model. Now, the first is the one that you just saw. You have many different regressors, and you try to find the beta weights uh, for all of those different regressors. Uh, all of the regressors stand for some elements of computation, if you will. Um, and uh, yeah, just having a very large design matrix doesn't hurt us like it would in a standard GLM analysis, it actually allows us to quantify the characteristics of this receptive field model. Uh, you do need to realize here that this is very sort of data driven. Uh, there's not really a strict mathematical model uh, here. Uh, and it's not very constrained. Right? This is just a sort of data analysis uh, routine that you do. On the other hand, and this is um, something that we use for that PRF model uh, fitting. There's a different way of uh, approaching this type of model, which is to actually construct an explicit mathematical model of what a voxel is doing, and then say, oh, but this model, I can dial parameter A, and that gives us, uh, that shifts this whole thing to the left and to the right. I can have parameter B, and if I change that, uh, it shifts the whole thing to the right. And if I have parameter C, it will rotate this orientation just a bit. And if I D, I can make it wider, you know, that sort of thing. And that means that you can actually go search for the optimal combination of parameter values uh, that best explains your voxels responses. And so it's a different approach to fitting the model. This is more mathematically model driven, more specific, and you need to be able to create a explicit mathematical model for what you're trying to capture. And these PRF models are dead simple, and so this works. For many of the things that we're going to look at after, it's this first approach that we use. We just, we don't have an explicit mathematical model, but we have a very rich description of what might be happening in our experiment, uh, and that we want to uh, compare against our data. Yeah? Any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, in, in the second one, we come up with the come up with an equation and then try to find the best parameter that explain the model. The first one finds the equation sort of for Yeah, but it finds the equation. Uh, so in this case, right, what you have is uh, like a thousand regressors. And so what you end up with is a thousand beta weights. Well, uh, good luck understanding what exactly that represents, right? Uh, so it's inherently more complicated. Uh, this, in this case, the parameters mean something. Right, so X or is the A parameter that I was just talking about, it means location in the horizontal plane, right? Uh, y means location in the vertical plane. So they are much more interpretable. Uh, here, you need to get the pattern of beta weights that you get out. It's a lot of beta weights. Okay, it's your task now to understand what the pattern means. And you can do this, but it's much more in the uh, tradition of machine learning, right? So you then have to do all sorts of analyses to make sense of this pattern of data. So whereas here you're doing the heavy lifting beforehand. Now in principle, these are interchangeable, right? I can, I, if I have an experiment, uh, I can do this type of analysis, I can do this type of analysis. In principle, that doesn't matter. Yeah? It's just what your preferred approach is. Yeah? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you're right. There is a trade off here. Right. So when you create a mathematical model, you have to throw out a lot of details. Right. You are making decisions as to what are the fundamentally relevant variables in the problem. Yeah. Whereas here, you just put anything in your design matrix and, you know, fit it and, you know, sort of kill them all and let God sort them out sort of approach. Yeah. Uh, that is inherently uh, difficult, right? Because then you're just postponing the hard work, right? Then you have to start making sense of what the beta weights mean. Um, and you still have to create all these regressors, right? So you might be missing something. Right? There might be something uh, to like the color that I'm not putting in my design matrix right now uh, that is causing me to miss certain types of responses, just as an example, right? So, uh, yeah, both suffer from this, but in different ways, in different gradations, right? So you have to do more work beforehand here, uh, more work afterwards here, but um, yeah, is that, that's sort of gradient between them, yeah? So both of these are just tools to understand the computation that's happening again inside these single voxels, what, this, what the population of neurons inside a voxel is doing in terms of, yeah in terms of its computations. Now, all of this is all just very simple visual stuff. And I'm now going to give you a whirlwind tour of what happens when you take this tradition, when you take this sort of conceptual framework of looking at single voxels and estimating what the single voxels are doing using these frameworks, specifically mostly this. Um, and we'll take it, well, we'll see what happens, right? So this receptive field of a voxel, right? If we add this um, orientation to it, uh, we still get location. So this is like that population receptive field. We've got this specific location. That's where that, that's what the, the region in visual space that this voxel like. But what we get extra is uh, the orientations that it like and the spatial frequency. That is how fine the patterns need to be to maximally activate this voxel. High spatial frequency means more fine detail. So this actually gives us now a voxel-based population receptive field that actually has the orientation and the spatial frequency in there. We're at the level of Hubel and Weasel now, but we're looking at whole voxels and not single neurons. So you see the analogy, hey, it just went back to working, right? We missed orientation just now. We were only looking at visual field location, but now we have it back. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is created from the beta weights uh, on each of these different regressors. And we can actually extend this to movies, so uh, we can add time to the mix uh, and then uh, fit these types of movies uh, and reconstruct from brain activity what people were uh, viewing. Right. So this is again that type of reconstruction that I was talking about, this type of decoding that I was talking about before. Now on natural movies. I sort of like this. This is actually already 12 years old. Uh, we can do a lot better uh, at the moment. Right, so uh, by increasing the complexity of our encoding model that we use to fit these things here, uh, we're using, we're adding time to the receptive field structure. Uh, we can now start to decode things that actually evolve over time. Uh, I don't know about you, but this, is both much um, richer and, in my mind, more convincing than the dream decoding example, uh, which didn't feature this intermediate step of actually trying to understand what each voxel separately is doing. Yeah. And uh, this approach has evolved uh, much further, just repeating myself there, but you know. Yeah. Great stuff. So now uh, you get the point. Um, that's nice. I've only talked about vision up until now, right? Because that's the sort of playground of the neuroscientists. That's what the Nobel Prizes came from. So that's what we're sort of stuck with. We know how things work there. So it's a good sort of test case. If you have thought of something, then the litmus test is to see whether it works 
this way in the visual system. But things get much more interesting when we uh, go looking beyond vision. Now having, I hope, convinced you of the fact that this paradigm works, right? This conceptual approach to using fMRI as a local neural population measurement, it holds, right? It does work. It's workable, at least. Um, I'm trying to see if I can... I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now, and then I, I need to, like, share it again on Zoom because they weren't hearing anything. And I can say, share sound. Oh, mother. Um, I'm sorry, I can't share the sound. So you're going to be uh, deaf for a while on the on the Zoom end. I will put these videos up um, online. Uh, computers. So uh, you can do this for sound. So we have a bunch of tonotopic maps in uh, auditory cortex. Like I, I was talking about retinotopic maps in the visual cortex, we have tonotopic maps that are specific for frequencies of sound uh, that you see here, I'm zooming into like A1. Um, and the receptor fields there, we know, uh, have a specific location in frequency space, and they have uh, characteristics like they like a certain glide going from one frequency to the other, like Whoa? that sort of thing. They like that you have specific neurons that like that sort of thing. Um, so this is what these uh, what, what sound waves might look like in a couple of these dimensions. Um, and so this is like a visualization of that. And I'm trying to well, that's the sound that goes with it. So the first sound that you heard, the first sound is the actual sound being played to the observer. And the second is the decoded sound, right? The, like the two movies that you saw side by side, kind of confusing if I play two sounds simultaneously. So there you have it. The real decoded sounds pretty okay, right? I mean, they're both birds. <laughs> that, that's the level of my <laughs> extent of my bird knowledge. Um, so, uh, also, if you do this from low level uh, auditory cortex, uh, you can get beyond all this. Wait, okay, so in the next uh, item, I'm going to first play you a human voice that's um, that's speaking, right? And then the reconstructed version of the speech pattern uh, from low-level auditory cortex. Yeah? So just listen and uh, enjoy. Beyond all this. So um, what this is what this is telling us, uh, you get the point, right? So you don't actually have all of the speech-related information in at the low levels of the uh, of the sound, uh, the way that it's processed in, in low-level uh, auditory cortex. You need more language-related skills and more language-related processing to actually uh, decode this, right? And so what this means is that this combination of fitting these encoding models and trying this decoding uh, gives us a very nice way of inspecting the type of processing that is happening uh, in specific regions of the brain. I like about this. Uh, we can do similar things with touch and so forth and so forth, but um, the fun thing happens when we go to outer space. Um, we can move to non-sensory dimensions that are behaviorally relevant. So in this uh, beautiful experiment, what these researchers did um, was to show people uh, patterns of different numerosities, and they controlled for low-level compounds such as uh, high the density, uh, the circumference, the size of these elements. And so this is a very boring experiment, I'll be honest. You're looking at 90 seconds of data here. And so what you're looking at is a single voxel time course uh, where what's happening on the screen is uh, there's, you're seeing one thing for like five seconds. Then you're seeing two things for five seconds, then three, and so forth, and so forth, up to 20, and then going back uh, from seven to one, and then back to 20. So you're just looking at flickering dots. And it's not just 90 seconds. This is the average of, I think, like 30 of these or 40 or 100 of these. 
Uh, and so people are just in the scanner for one and a half hours looking at a fixation mark and uh, being presented with different numbers. Yeah? What this means is you can actually then, uh, you're doing the same sequence over and over, so you can average across all of these repetitions and you get these beautiful time courses of signals that you can uh, try to estimate a numerosity model on. Right? So this is very similar to a PRF model, but we're not looking at visual space. Yeah? We're not looking at orientation in visual space. We're not looking at tone, height of tones in frequency space for audition. What we're looking at is uh, voxels that are selectively responding to certain numbers of items on the screen. And we can create this mathematical model for it. It's a very simple model, analogous to that statistical field model. We just say, in this voxel, we think the neurons uh, will like the number two more than they like the number three or one. And so you can estimate the peak of that receptive field tuning, and you can estimate its width, um, and fit these results uh, very, very well. Yeah? So these voxels are very, very close together in the brain. They're just like a centimeter apart. But one has a completely different time course than the other, but they are both selective for the number of items that appear on the screen. It's pretty weird. Right? It's not something that you would expect uh, by chance. And we can go further because when you look at these voxels on the surface of the brain, we actually see that these voxels form a map. So there is uh, a whole network actually of uh, numerosity maps in, in the brain. So they first found these regions in parietal lobe here. Um, and you see here, uh, likes high numbers here, likes low numbers, and similarly oriented uh, across individuals, more or less. Uh, very smooth progression, very similar to a tonotopic map in terms of sensation, very similar to a retinotopic map in vision, where neighboring voxels like neighboring positions in the visual field here, neighboring voxels uh, on the surface of the cortex like neighboring numbers on the number line. So we have here, a map of an abstract, cognitively relevant feature uh, in the brain. Yeah. Is thresholding based on explained variance? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what you do in this sort of thing is you see how well your time course explaining model fits, and you can do out of set predictions uh, to compare models, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we see that this is uh, uh, that, that we really find these beautiful uh, gradations of. Um, uh, of what numerosity a given voxel likes, right? There's a map there. But we also know from, uh, we'll get into this in more detail in like the neural models course and that sort of thing. Uh, there, is these, uh, there are these sampling uh, bias uh, things that come from just how uh, information is sampled. Uh, if something likes the number one more than the number two, uh, it's actually going to be narrower in terms of its tuning. It's going to be very precise. Whereas if you move up the number line, uh, they're going to be more imprecise. So the width of these models uh, really correlates very strongly with the, where their peak are, where their peaks are. And so if you have uh, a receptive field that has a peak very high, it's going to be very wide. And if you have a, a, a receptive field with a peak very uh, low, it's going to be very narrow. And that's just the way uh, the brain best samples the outside world. And it turns out, uh, that this is very strongly correlated in this type of abstract map also. So what we're, what we're thinking we're getting a handle on here is we're using this analogy of the receptive field, right? It's using this idea that we're sampling a neural population with our voxels. And then being able to really look at how even an abstract uh, space uh, is ordered inside uh, the brain. And we're really looking at uh, the characteristics of abstract information processing uh, inside the human brain. So that's nice. That's a nice example of uh, how even something that isn't directly related to the format of the information coming into the brain through the senses uh, is organized in this way and that our approach of this receptive field analogy, that it works to capture these types of responses and understand what the brain is doing. Uh, but we can go much, much further. And I want to uh, not waste space or time uh, going there. Because um, we've been verifying and validating our approach in the visual field, 
in the auditory field in, in these very specific receptive field models. And it seems like this is working. But we can go much, much further, right? We don't, now that we have this inkling that our approach is working, we can go further and maybe, you know, release all of the uh, boundaries. We can go to far more abstract spaces. We can go perhaps even to things like semantic spaces, like not that have to do with natural language processing. And this is also that website that I linked to uh, for before the lecture, right? Uh, that's actually what we're looking at here. So in this case, the first example of this um, is where uh, they showed people movies and they were labeled uh, with uh, 1,705 different nouns and verbs. So now there is a, a woman and a dog and a, she's talking and what have you in the, uh, in the movie. So now it's happening, right? So time is here. Uh, now there's women in the movie. Now there's talking in the movie. Uh, and you can see how this type of problem uh, lends itself to that ridge regression because we have a shit ton of regressors, right? We need to then use this phenolytic regression approach to uh, estimate these, uh, these responses. Because what this gives us is we're trying to estimate these bold responses over here for every voxel. Uh, we get these beta weights for all of these different regressors. And so what that means is uh, this analysis gives us for every voxel that we have in the brain, how much it likes women, how much it likes talking whenever it occurs in the, in the movie, how, like, how much it likes dogs whenever it occurs in the movie. So it's a very data-driven type of uh, approach, uh, but it does allow us to map the structure of semantic information processing as it happens in the brain. And so uh, what you get out of this is like a single voxel tuning curve uh, on a semantic space. Okay. You could think of it uh, in that way. And this then allows us to uh, estimate patterns of bold response even in data and movies that, this, uh, that the procedure hasn't even seen, right? And then it a totally separate test set. Now, what does this look like? I mean, 1,705 beta weights is kind of uh, hard to visualize. And so uh, what you can do uh, is work hard to make this more insightful. And you'll see examples if you go to that website. I really uh, advocate that you go there. So uh, one way is that you could uh, order all of these uh, words uh, according to what's called WordNet. It's just one way of uh, sort of building up a, a semantic space. So it has this sort of hierarchical structure that you see uh, in this sort of tree uh, structure here. And what you see here is then uh, the uh, beta weights for all of these different uh, regressors uh, for a given voxel. So this is a voxel in the parahippocampal place area. It should like places because it's why this region is called the parahippocampal place area. And you see that it does like things like buildings and containers and devices and vehicles. The thing that you see when you see places, uh, it likes. This also tells us that even though and this voxel is in the parahippocampal place area, it doesn't just like places, right? It doesn't just like buildings. It likes many different things that happen when you're near a building sort of thing. Okay. Is that a question or? All right, so this is a way of visualizing a receptive field now. It's gorgeous, right? So instead of having a receptive field in, uh, in visual space, now we have it in a semantic space. It's just that you know we have more leeway into um, uh, how to do this. Yeah. How does a voxel not like be at zero if it doesn't then go up if it does? Oh, you mean like what is a deactivation? Why would that? Why does this box not like balance the communication? Yeah. Why would it like explicitly dislike them? Yeah. That, my dear friend, is the philosophical question of the course. Um, we, we have an idea, right? Um, we had this uh, question in the practical, like implicit baseline versus, uh, contrast relative to other regressors, um, in fMRI, because we don't really know what the average value means, right? There's not, it's not a unit uh, that we have there. It's just a number. Um, 
we don't, the, the baseline is a construct. So, so when something goes below the baseline, well, it's below some construct. So we don't really know how to interpret things that go negative so well. So there's a interpretative issue there. Uh, we also don't know whether the link between neural activation and uh, bold uh, holds uh, similarly to how it does for activations, for deactivation, if that sentence made any sense. Um, and so, uh, yeah, difficult question. Um, I'm going to continue talking about other things, but I'm going to try to get back to this later on in later lectures, because it is a beautiful point. Uh, we like half, half of the things that you're showing to this voxel don't just make it silent. They actually decrease its activation, right? And if I were looking at this voxel's activation and I saw that it went negative, I wouldn't just say, well, there's no structure in the, in the image, right, in the movement. I would actually be able to say, hey, but maybe there's like a mammal with body parts in there, right? Because it's negative, right? And so in terms of a decoding analysis, you could actually use this deactivation even. Now, it turns out that you can in many cases. So uh, it's very interesting. Philosophical uh, rabbit hole, uh, like very few others. Uh, so let's get into it later on. Uh, but I'm going to try to, um, yeah, to get there, I hope, at some point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you found the course breaking question, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's say we do this. We have this beautifully complex receptor field structure now uh, for every voxel in the entire brain. So uh, we just made a step, right? We had these 1700 numbers and we managed to visualize them and it showed us some sort of sensitivity. Beautiful, like selectivity. Uh, but now uh, we have another problem. We have 100,000 voxels in which the same thing happens. So how do you quantify and visualize this 1,700 by voxels space? How do you do that? Well, um, you can do this by uh, what we call principal components analysis. So you sort of take all this complexity, you project it onto the components that have most variance. If that's abracadabra to you, then don't worry about it. Uh, we can reduce the dimensionality by magic uh, of this data set. Um, and then uh, we can start to inspect how over the population of voxels, over the entire brain, uh, this semantic space is being represented. And so what we're doing here uh, is we're uh, coloring everything according to these PCs, which are principal components, uh, things that vary together. And uh, coloring things like this means that the, it gives you sort of grouping of how information is represented uh, across uh, the human brain. So you get things like yellow is animals, uh, green is people. Uh, you get like purple is boats, apparently. Yeah. Um, like blue is rooms and structures. Um, you know, I think those are the, the, the major colors that we uh, can uh, end up seeing. Um, and so this is, uh, we can use this color table now and project it onto voxels, so onto the brain. And so uh, we can actually now, uh, across the cortex, uh, we have a map of how a given individual brain uh, represents semantic categories. So we can pinpoint a voxel, and I urge you to do it in the website that I link to. We can pinpoint a voxel and actually get like the word cloud that this uh, voxel likes. Uh, and so this gives us a, a way of capturing uh, semantic information processing uh, throughout the brain. And you do see that there is specialization on the surface of the brain. You see, for example, that, what was yellow again? Animals? You see, these regions really like animals, right? And they're quite different from these regions, uh, which like people, blue. So you see that there's like a functional specialization uh, and you also see that this is very sort of smooth, right? There's like these patches and gradations, uh, very sort of organic looking. It's not region here does this, region here does that, and they're completely separate. You see all of these intermediate colors, like this is a bit cyan and it's bordering yellow and green, right? It's all a bit mixed together. Uh, now, these researchers did a bunch of cool stuff with this. This is like their uh, thing. Uh, the website that I'm linking to that you can that you should go to uh, is actually an extension of this work where they're not showing movies, but they're showing they're not showing. They're letting people listen to podcasts in the scanner for like 20 sessions in a row. Um, it's actually a very nice podcast it's called the, the Moth Radio Hour. 
uh, it's like people like talking about a story, like giving you a story. There's like a storytelling uh, podcast. It's very nice. Uh, anyway, um, they did this separate um, experiment where they had people focus on and report uh, whenever there was a person in a movie. So the, the task is really simple. Press a button whenever you see a person. And then in another half of the sessions, what they would do is say, press the same button, but press it uh, when you see a car, when you see a vehicle. So what they're trying to do here is still have you see similar movies, but your mindset is, I have to press a button when I see a, a human being, person, or I'm focusing my, my mental capacities on detecting uh, vehicles. That's completely different. Like, if you imagine what that would feel like. <clears throat> and it turns out that um, you can actually show that uh, this sort of attentional state uh, shifts this semantic information processing uh, even within the single voxel. So uh, what I'm showing you here is some um, uh, voxels receptive field in this format uh, when the target is uh, vehicles, right? And now I'm going to switch to when uh, the thing is persons, right? So you see vehicles are here, right? They're pretty active. So I'm now going to switch to humans, like uh, persons, and you see that you know you get this cluster of beta weights arising there uh, for persons. And so what this means is that this voxel somehow the neurons in this in this voxel uh, move their activation from responding uh, to uh, vehicles to responding to people. Yeah. So you can actually look at the flexibility. Uh, that cognitive sets uh, give us in this semantic space, uh, which I think is pretty um, uh, cool. You can actually do like further analyses where this is sort of uh, two semantic axes similar to those principal components that we uh, talked about before. And you actually see that uh, all of the voxels, so every dot here is a voxel. Uh, if your template or your attentional search thing is humans, uh, your entire brain's semantic representation sort of move towards it. Whereas if your target is vehicles, uh, they move towards that. Yeah. Um, just as a, a highlight though, uh, these blue uh, voxels are a part of this default mode network uh, that I talked about in the neuroscience lecture. Uh, this region deactivates uh, when you show a visual stimulus. We don't know what that deactivation means. And here you see something even more puzzling. I won't quiz you on it in the exam, but no one knows what the default mode network does. So um, you see that it actually shifts away from its representation is now here, and then it shifts there. It shifts its representation away from what's in the, uh, what's in the attentional set, right? Uh, and we don't know what that is. So we have these regions in the brain. Uh, they're uh, blue here, so they're here, here, here in the frontal cortex, we have no idea what they're doing. We know that they're doing something with memory and that sort of thing, uh, but like the way that their semantic representation shifts as a function of cognition, of a task, uh, no one has an idea. Uh, if you um, go to the website that I uh, uh, linked, you can actually take out the, the latter part of the URL, just delete it. Uh, you can go to the lab's website where they actually also have a viewer for this specific result. So you can go through that too. It's also very uh, elaborate. Okay, so uh, we have now uh, this very beautiful sort of conceptual thing, this analogy from going from neurophysiology to fMRI, right? And it seems to be relatively productive and we can take the paradigm to uh, semantic spaces. We can go further. Uh, we can try to use as a model of what a voxel is doing convolutional neural networks, right? So we can use AI-derived methods as a mathematical model of what the brain is doing and then see how these uh, map onto uh, the brain. Okay. So for every voxel, uh, we can now estimate, uh, for example, uh, what layer of a convolutional neural network that's optimized to be able to discern cats from dogs and what have you, um, which layer of this network corresponds best to the responses of a given voxel? 
So uh, in this sort of uh, thing, of course, you get, I, I don't know, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about already, but those of you that don't, uh, we train the parameters of this model on uh, gazillions of images, right? And the, the model learns to discriminate between all sorts of object categories in images. And uh, when you look at these different layers in the network, right? So it's, it's structured similar to the human visual system in that you have lower layers and higher la layers and information percolates up through these layers. Uh, it turns out that if you inspect the units in these uh, neural networks, uh, they actually have at the lower layers, they look very similar to those uh, models that we use to describe things ever since the Hubel and Weasel uh, stuff, right? And as we go up the layers, uh, you see that we start to see things like protofaces, uh, things like that, right? So the, the units in these higher levels seem to be more specialized to specific categories of objects. And if that doesn't sound like a human visual system, by thing, uh, I don't know what else it does. What we can then do uh, is use these regression approaches, like the, the ridge regression, for example, to just take all the activations for all the nodes in our um, in our convolutional neural net neural network and see uh, which of these uh, predicts the voxel response best throughout the visual system. And what we find <laughs> is that we can uh, actually explain a lot of the variation that happens when people view images. Uh, as a function of what's happening in a convolutional neural, neural network responding to the same images. And that if we look at uh, V1 here in the middle to V2 to V3, right, that's a, a hierarchy of the visual uh, cortex. Uh, we see that uh, the higher levels of the uh, visual brain in a human being, uh, they actually uh, have, they represent the higher layers in these convolutional neural networks. Uh, better uh, than the lower layers, right? So you see low in the visual system uh, seems to conform to low in the uh, in the current convolutional neural network uh, and high with high across brain and a convolutional neural network. Right? So um, as neuroscientists, why are, or are these encoding models interesting, right? Why do we want to do this sort of model-based fMRI? Well, <laughs> If we do this, by so we fit these encoding models, uh, what we do is we have this sort of cross-validation thing going, of course, and then uh, we can actually compare different encoding models. So what that means is we have explicit ideas about what the brain is doing in computational terms, and we can then test them against what the brain is doing. One of the papers that we'll be reading towards the end of the course really exemplifies this. Um, we'll get into that uh, more. Uh, we can we can um, we can explore the behavior of our models under different conditions, and again, uh, like look at what the model is doing, and then again compare that to uh, brain activation. Um, and what I think is the, is the beauty of this, and and also the the, the promise of this sort of approach, uh, is that we can use fMRI voxels as quasi electrodes. Right? Uh, it it uh, links us to this tradition. Uh, older tradition in uh, animal electrophysiology, um, and it makes for a very, very strong inferential framework uh, for uh, fMRI. It becomes a biological measurement, if you will. Um, I don't have anything more to say, I do think. Do I? No, oh, I have another slide. Yeah, so you can also decode. That's, uh, I've seen, I've shown you this a couple of times. Uh, right, you can, when you have this explicit model of what every single voxel is doing, uh, you can actually use it to recreate stimuli from a pattern of brain activations and going beyond just saying percentage correct uh, based on a pattern. Cool. Um, have a nice weekend. And um, let's look at this because it's awesome. Hey, I have a question. Uh, Good, I hope. <laughs> uh, 